I just want to welcome those of you here on campus, those of you online, and I know uh, some of you are watching from different states, different places, different countries. Uh, we're so glad you're with us. Um, uh, here locally, though, did you hear about the, uh, the, the big rig 18-wheeler? I realize we call those things different things based off of where we grew up. Um, so uh, big rig 18-wheeler or where I grew up, a tractor trailer. Did you hear about that at Ontario Mills on Monday, the one that sort of got out of control in the parking lot? No, you didn't hear about it because as it was careening down the parking lot out of control because the driver forgot to set the air brakes, which it's a mistake, I get it. My tiny little Honda Accord heroically jumped in front of the uh, tractor trailer and stopped it from plowing down other things in the parking lot. Um, but my tiny little Honda Accord was no match for this giant big rig, and so it called in some reinforcements, meaning the Toyota Camry next to it for backup, and my Honda Accord became the peanut butter and jelly of the sandwich of a tractor trailer and a Toyota Camry. And it saved the day. Russell and I, uh, who, Russell, who's leading us in worship today, uh, we, were, we were having lunch, and so we walked out, and, and, and I was like, I don't park crooked. Like, I, I, I can park better than that. And then we were looking at the other car, like, why did they park so, so close to us? Like, we were baffled. We were trying to figure out, how did this happen? Like, what is going on here? We couldn't make sense of it. And, and we were coming up with theories, and, and, and one of them was maybe a, a pyramid-shaped UFO moved my car over if you've been watching the news. One of them was we were, we were examining the asphalt for tire tracks and rubber, like, okay, what happened here? And it wasn't until I finally had the idea, I wonder if there's anything on my windshield that I realized there was a note with a name and a number and an apology uh, for what had happened. And, and apart from those words, I would have no idea what had happened. I would have tried to make sense of, well, let me tell you what might have happened. Uh, but I wouldn't have known necessarily the truth, and so I, I was able to make sense of a pretty, pretty difficult situation for my car. Not a big deal, it's a car. Because I had a note that explained it, then I talked to the driver who told me what had happened. I, I had a, an eyewitness. He just happened to be the driver, too. And that note brought everything. Okay, I get a perspective. I, I can understand in a, in a different way. Now I, okay, now I know. I know what happened. If you got your Bible, take it. Uh, if you got a smartphone, uh, or a tablet, Matthew chapter 16 is where we're going to be, and we're going to see a note, see a message, see Jesus speaking to us to, to try to help us understand, to, to try to help us make sense and get some wisdom, get some, some insight that, that would give a perspective to our life that you and I cannot get on our own. We cannot get this perspective apart from Jesus. And without him speaking, and revealing, then, then we're sort of blindly trying to make sense of things that we're not really going to be able to make sense of on our own. Matthew chapter 16, I'll start reading in verse 13. Matthew writes this, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? This is a Jesus pointing to himself. Who do, who do people say that I am? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So back then, just like in our day, there's all kinds of answers to the question, who is Jesus? In this day, somebody may say, Jesus is a really good teacher, and you should probably follow his morals. I mean, all the other stuff about being God, don't worry about that. Some would say Jesus is a miracle worker and when we need a miracle in life, we go to him like he's a genie in the bottle and we pray, do this miracle thing, Jesus for me. In this day, they say, some say John the Baptist, some say maybe he's like John the Baptist and Jesus is going to come preaching repentance. Others say, no, no, he's like Elijah. He did miracles and we just want him to do more miracles. Others say he's sort of like Jeremiah. He's a, he's a prophet and he's declaring the words of God. So there's all kinds of different answers. The truth is people don't exactly know in this moment who Jesus is. So then Jesus turns and says, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? Jesus asks. Now, as a good southern boy notices, this you is not a singular. This you is a plural. So Jesus isn't just saying, Peter, who do you say? He's asking the disciples, who do y'all say that I am? Who do y'all say that I am? And, and he's, he's longing to know to his disciples, do you, do you know who I am? And 
we know that Peter doesn't always get things right. We know that Peter's a work in progress. Anybody glad that Peter's still a work in progress because you're still a work in progress? And he, he, who, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. He may not have always gotten things right, but man, this time, home run, grand slam, got it right. And Jesus replies, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. J Jesus is saying that, Peter, you didn't get this from reading a book or listening to a podcast. You didn't get this from conversation around the dinner table, Peter. Your, your understanding is, is something that was revealed to you. It's something that, that it's a, a wisdom only God can give to you. And Jesus is sort of saying to Peter, you, you got it. Like, that's, that's right. But you got to know that, that you got that because the Spirit of God is doing a, a work in you. But Peter's answer is profound. Because not everybody understood Jesus in those terms. And, and, and what we begin to learn as Jesus is teaching his disciples is that if, if you're going to live the life that Jesus invites you to live, you don't do it in your strength, you do it in his. If you're going to follow Jesus in every way in your life, you don't do it because you've figured out the way, you do it because you follow Jesus in the way. And it's not just information that we say, oh, I'm thinking the right thoughts, so I'm following Jesus. It's a transformation of our entire life. That Jesus is saying, I want you to follow me in every one of these areas. And it, it impacts the way we make decisions. It, it impacts the wisdom that we live with. It, it impacts the way that we treat other people. When, when we begin to understand who Jesus is, for, for me, let me personalize it. When I begin to understand who Jesus is, that's how I learn what it means to be a real friend. We talked about that last week. When I begin to understand who Jesus really is and, and who I am in light of that, that's when I discover the, the strength or the wisdom to be the kind of husband that God would want me to be and my wife would need or the kind of father or the kind of pastor. When we do our jobs, not just a pastor job, but like any job, this understanding of who Jesus is and, and our identity in him gives us what we need to be the best at doing that. To, to align our lives to who God is. This, this question is massive. Who do you say that Jesus is? Not just with your words, but with your life, with your actions. See, there's, there's this element of, of the cross, and as we celebrated the cross two weeks ago, we celebrated the resurrection. We, we remembered all that, that Christ has done. There's, there's this vertical dynamic that, that is our belief in, in who God is. It's, it's this saving belief. It's this we repent, we believe, we turn, and, and that's that God part that is first and foremost foundational to a relationship with Christ. But there's also this horizontal part that is played out in our relationships with others. This horizontal part that is how do we live life on this earth, not just vertically like when we die and go to heaven kind of thing. But, but our life looks different. Our choices are different. Our, uh, our, our, our desires are refined by God. How do we live this life? And right here, Jesus is saying, who do people say that I am? But, but then look at verse 24, just nine verses later. Jesus is saying it's not just the things we say or the things we think. It's also the way we live. Verse 24, Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. If we're going to follow Jesus, it's going to require sacrifice. If we're going to follow Jesus, it's going to require denying ourselves. If we're going to follow Jesus, there, there's going to be transformation that's needed every step of the way. We don't ever just arrive. And so as Jesus is looking to these disciples. He's saying it starts with, with y'all. Like individually. Our hearts before God. Our, our seeking Christ in every way. It, it starts with us. But then something really interesting happens when you get to verse 18. There's an and. And Jesus adds a little bit something to it that is monumental for us today. And for why you're here right now. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So Jesus goes from talking about his disciples, the, the y'all here, the, the you that are plural, to all of a sudden making this very interesting statement about the church. Now, 
This is the first time the word church is used in the Bible, as best we can tell. If, if you were to write now, don't do this out loud, but if you were to define church, like come up with a little definition in your head. What would it be? Church is, and then just like, give me a definition. I'll get to that in just a moment. Church is whatever. In, in the Greek, this, this, this word for church, ekklesia, here's technically what it means. Are you ready? You may want to write this down. It means a group. That's, that's it. Like, when, when this word is used, his disciples are thinking, like, church, like, a group. Like, they would use that if you're going to a potluck. Anybody know what a potluck is? You remember those things? If you're going to, like, a town meeting, it's, a, it's an ecclesia. In, in that day and age, it's, a, it's just a group. But all the difference is made when Jesus says, my church. I will build my church. And he takes this conversation from the individual or, or, or even the, the few and he takes it to the many, and he says, let me, let me change the conversation for just a minute. Let me talk about my church, Jesus' church, the ones following me, the ones going after me. And, and this is what makes a church, a group following Jesus, different than a country club. Some of you belong to a country club. That's great. Invite me someday. That'd be amazing. That'd be amazing. In a country club, though, you pay dues, and, and, and as a member, you have rights and privileges as a member that jokers like me just don't get. So I can't just go play golf at your country club. I have to go with you. And you pay the dues. I'll gladly come to your country club if you pay the dues. But a country club exists to take care of the members. But a church is not a country club. A church doesn't exist to take care of its members. It exists for those who don't even know Jesus yet. There's, there's a uniqueness. Jesus says, I will build my church. A church is not a political party. A political party is a group and a church is a group. But a political party is built off of preferences and policies. And the church is built off of humble sacrifice. That's why there's a cross. And it's why Jesus says, take up your cross. Follow me. Deny yourself. There is something different. And what's different at the core, let me get Theological. Can I get theological for you? I've got to because we built a slide, so I have to show the slide off. To, so get theological. Show this slide real quick. To, to understand ecclesiology on the right, that's, that's the form and function of a church. Uh, you, you have to understand what, what's called Christology. Who is Jesus? The person and the work of Jesus. The cross, the empty tomb. Who is Jesus? That's the answer to that question. That's Christology. But missiology is also part of this, and this is the purpose of God and his people. And some people think that in 2020, God lost his purpose or the world lost their purpose as if God is not at work. And God is still at work, newsflash, even through a pandemic, God is at work. The purpose of God and the purpose of his people. God still has a purpose for your life and for mine. And then the ecclesiology is the form and the function of the church. So if we're going to be a church, that, that's good for that slide. If we're going to be a church, that is following Jesus. We've got to be all about Jesus and who he is and what he has done and his work among us. And when I'm experiencing Jesus in my life and you're experiencing Jesus in my life and we all come together on a Sunday morning, there's an overflow of the work that God is doing. We don't come here just to say, now I need to experience God. We come here because we all are experiencing God. And when we come together today, it overflows. But so often we say, no, 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 no. There's, there's six days a week, and I'll give God that Sunday morning hour. But the other 167 hours are mine. And we'll lack the power, and we'll lack the experience of God doing what only he can do. Okay, I, I, I'm getting ahead of myself now, because I don't want to miss this. Here's what Jesus says. I will build my church, but do you remember the next promise? In the gates of Hades, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell will not prevail against. When God is doing his work and what God is up to, when we look at the Christology, the work of Christ, the missiology, the purpose, nothing can stop the purpose of God. And when we look at the ecclesiology, nothing can stop God's church. I don't mean hillside. I mean the people of God following God. The church is people, not a building. The church is not four walls or whatever on a property for Hillside on Haven Avenue. The church is the people of God living out the mission of God for the glory of Jesus in this world. And Jesus says, if that's true, if that's the case, the gates of Hades cannot overcome it. 
A tractor trailer may overcome a little baby Honda Accord until it calls in the Toyota Camry next door to help out a little bit. But the gates of Hades cannot, will not overcome or prevail the work of the church. Now, there's a whole lot here. I gotta hurry up. But gates are, are not an offensive weapon. We're not under assault. Gates are defensive. And we who are following Jesus are supposed to be somewhat on the offensive, taking ground, taking enemy territory, not afraid. And I'm just concerned. I'm so concerned in this series, in this season. Where does fear and anxiety and division come from when it's within a church. If Jesus says in the, he's building his church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, why would we be afraid? Why would we be filled with anxiety? Why would we be looking around our world saying, it's all out of control, there's no hope, we're living in the last days, and I don't mean in an anticipatory kind of way, I mean in a fearful, overwhelmed kind of a way, where we're like, the sky is falling, instead of saying, this is God's time, we are God's people, God has a purpose, and we need to be on mission in this world. I'm trying to figure that out mathematically. 12% of us are, 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 are all in right now. 80, what is that? 8% of us are like, eh, I don't know. Maybe. The gates of Hades will not overcome it. The gates of Hades is, is referring to, to death. It's, it's referring even to the, the work of the evil one. It's referring to uh, like powerful opposition and powerful leaders, satanic forces have no power against Christ and his church. That's why Paul writes in Romans 8, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him, through, through Christ who loved us. He didn't just say we're conquerors, he says we're more than conquerors. And then Paul says, I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels or demons, nor present nor the future, nor any powers, no height, no depth, anything in us of all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So why would we be afraid? Why, why would we be able to think that even in the midst of a pandemic, even if we're not meeting together on a Sunday morning in person, that God's work can be stopped when God's like, I got something called the internet. People all over the world are doing it. You should check it out. And the mission of God has gone forward in the last year into all of the world as no time in history. That's how God works. What, what we, we would look at it in our world and say, that's going to stop God's work. God's like, you can't stop my work. I'm doing things you couldn't imagine all around the world. Now, sometimes we don't see it. Sometimes we're not a part of it. And so this message now takes a little bit of shift from you and me and us, y'all kind of stuff to say, then, then what does it mean to be the church? And here you are at church. Why are you here? For, for us specifically, we've wrestled with this for years. And years ago, we came up with this statement. It's our vision statement. Again, it's on a slide. And so I hope I don't forget these slides. Heather worked hard to do these. Our vision is to see God's hope transform our cities one story at a time. We believe every single story matters. Every single person matters. Every single life matters. And we want to see God's hope not just do a little bit of a difference, not just a little bit of a change. We want to see transformation happen. I know my life has been transformed by Jesus, and I don't want him to stop. I want him to keep on doing his work in my life and in our church. And so God's hope in the midst of Desperate times and times of despair. God's hope, we want to see it bring transformation to our cities because our cities are desperate for light in the midst of a dark world. And they're looking, who would we look to to find hope? And we're the only ones that can say, look to Jesus. Look to what he's done. Look to Easter power. It's two weeks ago, but it's still just as real today that, that Jesus died. He was buried and he was raised to life. And we point him to a cross. We point them to say, this is where hope is found. We, we point those who are trapped in addiction, in a relationship that seems beyond repair, feel like their life is falling apart, depression is flooding their soul. We point them to the hope of Jesus. We say, here's the vision. We want to see God's hope transform your story too. And all around the world as well. In places like Mexico and Kenya and India, where we at, we're at work, we want to see God do what only he can do. That's our vision, see God's hope transform our cities one story at a time. But the, the, the mission that, that we talk about how to accomplish that is in three parts. We say it this way, here's a slide. Experiencing God's love, growing in community, serving with compassion. 
I want to break those down real quick. Number one, experiencing God's love. I think I was 18 years old, 17, 18 years old. And I, I've long forgotten the stat, but I, I remember hearing a speaker share this, and I'll never forget the moment, although I forgot some of the details. The, the conversation was about uh, people who attend church were surveyed. They attend church regularly, and they were surveyed about their encounters, their experiences with God. And I'm a young guy thinking, this is interesting, when I found out that two-thirds of the people surveyed, two-thirds of people who say they faithfully go to church all the time, two-thirds of them said, I cannot remember the last time I had a personal experience with Jesus. And as a young guy, I just thought, I, I, I can't even believe that. And then I also thought, then why do you keep going? I wasn't a pastor. And to be honest, I had no plans to be a pastor at 18 years old. Uh, at five years old, my Sunday school teacher, Clinton Brown, came to my house, knocked on the door. I'm like, yes, sir, what do you want? Young man, one day you're going to be a pastor. And I wanted to say, old man, you're crazy. No, thank you. It took 17 years for that story to come back around and before I said yes to God in that call on my life, but I'll never forget that moment of, of, of just hearing this stat. Two-thirds of the people who regularly, faithfully attend church, they're there, they show up, but they're not experiencing God. And I just thought, how can that be? How can that be where, when God is saying, I, I, I have spoken you can read it, you, you can pull away. Now, I get that there are times in life that are drier than others. I get that there are times in life that are harder than others, but for two-thirds of the people surveyed when I'm 18 years old, I'm, I'm hearing this, they keep going to church, but they don't experience God, and I just thought something's wrong. Either with them, or with the church, or the world, or all three. But I even thought as a young, young guy, if I'm ever a part of leading a church, God, I pray it won't be like that. God, I want people to experience God's love. I want when we come together to worship, it to be an overflow of what you and 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 you online and what I have done in our personal time that when we come together, it's an overflow. And for those who are hungry and those who are lost and those who are in darkness, you can see us worship, you can see our faith and you can get into the flow because we're like pointing people to Jesus. Because John tells us, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The whoever, that's us. It refers to a personal, dynamic, ongoing, intimate relationship with Jesus. And that's why we exist, to point people to the love and the hope of Jesus so that they could experience God's love in the midst of sometimes our hardest and darkest moments in life. In Matthew chapter 28, we're given what's called the Great Commission that, that helps us even know our purpose as a, as a church. Uh, more specifically, Jesus comes and he says, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So, so Jesus says a couple things that are so important. He says, I've got all authority in the whole entire world. So what do you think a governor or a president or an emperor is going to do? All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. So, so in light of the authority that Christ has as a church, as people, go and make disciples. There's a, there's a purpose to help lead people to Christ and to help people grow to become more like Christ. That, um, excuse me, allergies are bad. That's why uh, two weeks ago on Easter, as we celebrate 50 girls, boys, women, and men following Jesus in baptism, we're like, that's the start of a journey with Christ, and it's a beautiful start, and there's a long road ahead, and it is amazing. And we're so thrilled. But it doesn't stop with getting baptized. It just starts. And then the goal is making disciples, teaching them to obey everything. And when we, years and years ago, started looking around at this area that, that we're in specifically, that was before we were online and all these things, our hearts broke when we just learned around us there's 500,000 people who do not know Jesus. 500,000 people who 
They don't have hope in times of despair. They don't turn to Jesus. They don't look to the cross when it feels like life is falling apart. And we, a church, are planted in this place to point others to Jesus. And I get it. We can look at California and say, you know how messed up California is? You know how many problems California has? And I would say, yep, know all that. Guess what? This is a mission field. And we're missionaries. We're, we're at a place, unless God is leading you to go somewhere else, God is saying, I want you right here, right now, for a time such as this, to live for me, to point other people to Jesus. In church, we have a mission, and we're in a mission field. And when you go to work, and when you go to school, and when you go home with your neighbors, you can look and complain about everything that's not going the way you wish it would, or you could say, God, give me eyes to see where you're at work. And I want to join you. God, give me eyes to see that person that you're, you're stirring in their heart. They're, they're softening up to be receptive for you. And we can complain and murmur all we want, or we can say, God, I, we want to be a part of what you're doing in this world. We want to join you and help others experience your love. Look at this slide. When we talk about experiencing God's love, we're talking about weekend gatherings in person and online. Children's, students, young adults, baptism, I believe, next steps, all that kind of stuff. All that kind of stuff. Thank you. But because we know this, we, we know in seasons like the one we've been through, they're so divisive. Some people have left Hillside. I know that. But some are brand new and you're just showing up. And, and I'm wanting you to be clear. This is who we believe God is calling us to be. And my wife and I got the privilege on, on Tuesday of being a part of what we call our Next Steps track. There's, um, I don't know, 20-some people who were on, on that uh, Zoom call. Let me just give you a little background. So we share, hey, how are you doing? I'm Aaron. I'm she's Holly. And then I go to a meeting Wednesday morning, and one of our staff's like, Holly was so good on that Next Steps call. Holly just did a great job. And I'm like, thanks a lot. I'm so grateful for that. But one of our other staff members said, here's what's amazing about those that were on that call. Every single person said, where can I connect? How can I serve? I want to make a difference. I want to be a part. They didn't say, do you have a chair that I can sit in a little bit longer? They said, I want to be a part. I want to connect. I want to get engaged. I want to do, I want to see the vision, the mission come alive. It's experiencing God's love. Second, growing in community growing in community. We're not supposed to live life alone. We've not been invited to try to figure it out in our own strength. We're to be growing in community, in relationship with other people. Last week, like almost at this time, I'm teaching and I was sharing this story about how I've been around some of the widows at Hillside who've encouraged me and uh, they, they've said things like this, like I don't know how I could have made it through this last season losing my husband uh, apart from the church. As I was saying that, there was someone online watching who just typed in the chats, I'm a widow. I lost my husband a few months ago and I showed up to church on a Wednesday night and nobody said anything to me. Crushing. But she wasn't saying it complaining. This is what's amazing. She wasn't saying it like pointing a finger. She wasn't saying, I need sympathy. Here's what she said. You know what that did? She said, it opened up my eyes to start to be more aware of other people all around who nobody is speaking to, who feel isolated, and now I want to be part of the solution to welcome those. I was like, hero. <laughs> That's a hero. Growing in community. Jesus in John 13 says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That, that our, 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 our message isn't just what we say, it's how we live. And how we live as a message to this world is that our love for each other is so unique and purposeful and intentional that it's like a magnet that draws people to Jesus. They, they see the love of Jesus in our relationships. Now, see, that doesn't mean that we get along. It, it doesn't mean that we always have all things in common. I, I said this last May in a sermon, and, and I got some feedback about it. When, when I moved to California, a, a lot of people thought I was crazy. Um, and they were like, are there churches there? I'm just kidding. They didn't say that. Uh, but, but one of the things that I learned when I moved to California is how diverse this area is in thought. 
It's, it's more diverse in thought than any place I've ever lived in my whole life. And people are thinking different on different issues. People vote different. People have different opinions. And they don't realize that sometimes they sit on the same row at church. Did I just ruin it for you? <laughs> And I thought that's part of the beauty of the kingdom of God is we can be different, we can have our own thoughts, and we can be a message to the world that even when we have differences, we don't have to be divisive. Amen. And we don't have to be the kind of people who argue and yell, we can be the kind of people who listen and lean in. And it's a part of the community that Christ is wanting to develop in us. Not to mention the fact that so many suffer in silence. This is probably the most disconnected time in the history of our world, and we have more ways to be connected than ever before. And a new technology is not going to fix that. For months now, here's been my, my saying to our staff, and you'll, you'll see how wise I am. It's about relationship, relationship, relationship. It's about our relationship with God, vertically. Our relationship with others, horizontally. It's about relationship, relationship, relationship. That's the purpose of the church. Now listen, we don't always do our purpose well. Churches don't. Churches don't always fulfill this as we should. But our goal is to strive and to lean into this as we follow Jesus to, to be in authentic relationship with others, to, to be ourselves, to, like we talked about last week, to be able to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice, to have compassion and empathy growing in our lives, to, to serve side by side. It's not about sitting in rows, always looking forward as one person does all the talking. It's about sitting in circles and looking into each other's eyes and saying, tell me your story and I'll tell you my story of who Jesus is. It's, it's being known and it's following Jesus together with others. When it comes to growing a community, here's a slide, just some of the options, some of the things we have going on. We have community groups. We have adult groups like Sunday school and women's and men's and re-engage and prayer and care and recovery groups. We have all these avenues that we say that that's how sort of we're seeing this come to life and many of you are, are in some of these groups. One of those, re-engage, may be a little new. Let me, let me tell you about that because you'll hear a lot about that in the coming months. It's, it's, there's 39 couples, I believe, right now going through Reengage, making space for hundreds of you to do this in the fall. Because as we looked at the stats, not just in our world, we all know the stats in our nation, like uh, marriages are in crisis in our nation. Maybe you didn't know this. Close to here, all over Rancho Cucamonga and, and local cities, marriages are in a higher, higher than national average state of crisis. And we're the church. We're Jesus' church. We, we know where hope can be found for couples in crisis. We, we know that, that because of who Jesus is and what he has done and where God has placed us, we can help. We can help people who are hurting and they don't know what to turn. So that's just one example of what it looks like to be growing in community and learn that you don't have to do this on your own. Uh, third is serving with compassion. Serving with compassion Jesus modeled this for us. Mark chapter 10 is a great example. Jesus says, for even the son of man, he says, even I, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus comes with this model of, of, of servanthood. He, he could have demanded that everyone serve him and worship him, but he said, no, no, no. Selfless, sacrificial service is the way that his kingdom moves forward, the way that his church moves forward in this world. And serving is not just about being busy and doing stuff. That, that, that next part of it is, is just as important as the activity. Serving with compassion. If we're not serving, it's probably not that we have a serve problem. It's that we have a compassion problem. We're probably not seeing other people as Jesus sees them. Our hearts aren't breaking over the things that break God's heart. When, when we begin to see others the way that Jesus sees them, we're going to be filled with compassion and want to serve them, want to do something, be moved into action, not just say, somebody should do something about this. We'll say, no, no, what's my part? How can I participate? How can I be a part of this? We'll, we'll start saying, 
Yeah, there's this person on my street. They're called my neighbor, and they're not doing well. I wish somebody would love my neighbor. I wonder if the Bible says anything about that. Like, but I don't know their names. Well, that's a good place to start. Before you start serving them, just get to know their names. Start there. But it's easier said than done, right? But God is like, I- I've got you right where you are. Maybe for this moment. Early this morning, I was praying for all of us, and I just felt like God led this phrase on my heart. But like, I want to be like careful. Some of you are in a season where you, you just need to rest for a minute. You have a pause season. I get that. For the rest of us, this is what God laid on my heart. If you are not serving, you probably are not growing. Like when, when we're coming alive to Christ, we want to serve others. We're, We're actively using our gifts, our talents, our resources, our opportunities to make a difference in the lives of others. When when we talk about serving with compassion, here's a slide. We talk about it like this. Three things, serve the church, serve the city, serve the world. Serving in the church, there's opportunities that abound. You may think this is a big church. You got a lot of people, they can serve. I would say this is a big church. We got a lot of opportunity, but not enough people to do the things. Serve the church, serve the city. We have local partners all around this area, whether that's feeding the hungry, whether that is is helping those struggling with addiction, whether that's working within the foster care system. Serve the church. We wanna be the kind of church that the cities around us know we love them and we care. Serve the world. We've got global strategic partners in Mexico, India, and Kenya that we love the ministry God has uh, and, and what he is doing. And even in the midst of the difficulty of this last season of a pandemic for our global partners, they are still faithfully serving God despite great opposition. You want to talk about persecution? Well, they can tell you some stories. India can tell you some real stories right now of persecution breaking out. And what that looks like. And we want to support our partners. We want to come alongside them in any way we can and serve with them. But but here's part of what I what I sense in this season. It it can be true if we're not careful. In in a season like this, we can we can be known for what we're against. As Christians in America or in this world, we can be known for what we're against. I'm against this, I don't like this, I didn't vote for that, I wish this would change. We can be known for what we're against. The truth is, I can look at social media profiles of a lot of people I know, and I can tell you a lot of things that they are against because they post on social media about those things all day long, especially Facebook. But I don't really know what they're for. I just, I'm like, I wish I knew what you were for because I know what you're against, but it seems like all you talk about is what you're against, but would you just tell me what you're for? And I wanna tell you, here's what we're for. We are for Jesus. We are for Jesus' work in this world. We are for what Jesus has done, and we're not going to stop. We're not gonna stop saying, this is all about Jesus. We're not talking about all those other things all the time. If, if If you're sick and tired of us talking about Jesus, you're gonna be really tired about us talking about Jesus in the coming days. If you're tired of us talking about Jesus wants a personal relationship with you where you're experiencing God's love, if you're tired of it now, you're really gonna be tired of it in the the days to come. If you're tired about hearing us say, no, you need to be in a group, who are you doing life with? Real, authentic community. If you're tired about that now, you're gonna be really tired about that in the future because we're gonna say, it's not about sitting in a chair, watching from the sidelines, get in a group. And I'm just telling you, Thursday morning, I was with my five guys. We're not the restaurant like the five guys I'm in a group with. Reading a book that we're going through, and we didn't even get to the book because we were just talking about real life. And I needed that this week. If you're tired of us talking about serving the church or serving the city or serving the world now in these next months, you're going to be really tired of it because we think God has a purpose for your life. And maybe we believe what God has for you is even better than what you believe God has for you. And we want to invite you to serve with your gifts and your talents and your opportunity to point other people to Jesus and to make a difference in this world and to not waste your life and to not waste the pain of this season. But say, God, we want to go after you with all of our heart. And when we do that individually, when we do that in our groups, when we come together, there's an overflow of your power and your presence. We want to see what you can do. We did a staff retreat in 2019, like two years ago. And and one of our staff members just came up with this document that listed all of our ministries. So in 2019, we had 39 different unique ministries. 
Now, I don't know if you know anything about organizations. It's really hard for any organization to do 39 different things well. And in some ways it felt like we're doing a whole bunch of stuff and we're really busy, but we're not sure how effective we're being at anything because we're so busy. And so obviously in the midst of the shutdown of our world because of the coronavirus, uh, we did this uh, because we had to, but we started simplifying and focusing. We had to simplify and focus because we couldn't do some of the things that we used to do. As we now are starting to get back into finding a rhythm and finding a pace and that kind of thing, what, what we know is there's only so much energy, there's only so much time in a season like this, and, and simplify. Focus has just been echoed in our staff meetings and leadership meetings, board meetings. We need to simplify. We need to focus. There's some things right now that are mission critical, and we've got to give time and attention to those. That's the things I listed with experiencing God's love, the things we listed for growing in community, the things we listed for serving with compassion. But there's other things that in this season right now, we're not going to do for now. Doesn't mean we're not going to ever do them again, but for now, we're not going to be able to do those things because we're zeroing in, we're simplifying and focusing to things that we say are mission critical to the next season. Now, some of the things we're saying we're not going to do right now are things that have made profound influences in some of our lives. Some of the things that we've had a legacy in that have made a massive impact in our lives so we don't take this lightly, this is a serious weight of leadership, but not at this time. Things that we're like, right now in this moment, we're not gonna do it yet. Things like arts, babysitting, sports, Fontana, internship, coffee bar, some of the events that we've been known for, Rooted, the story. And I'm like, those are big things. Those are things that some of us would say, yeah, but I came to Hillside because of that, and I, and I get that. Or that made a massive impact on my life. And I get that. But in a season of simplifying and focus and saying, but, but right now, if we don't give attention to mission critical things, we're, we're afraid of what the future looks like. Not afraid, but, but we just don't want to be distracted. We got to stay focused. Simplify and focus. So something like sports that has had a profound impact on this church. We're saying not that we're never going to do sports again, but right now in this moment, in this season, it's not going to be one of the first things we do as we come back. And I get for some of you, you're like, my kids have been looking forward. I get that. Uh, some of you have like, my kids have always been in ASO. And that's great. That's amazing. Others of you, maybe you've heard about this new group. It's called Level Up Sports for Kids. Level Up Kids Sports. I would just recommend that to you. If that's what you've been longing for for your, your young child, that's a great opportunity. But right now in this season, we're saying we've got to be focused We've got to be focused. We've got to simplify because what Jesus is telling us is, I will build my church. I'm going to do the work, but I need you to follow me step by step in this season. I need you to follow me. So, so when we look at experiencing God's love, we're thrilled that two weeks ago, 50 of you stepped forward. You were baptized. You started out this journey. But we're like, there's 500,000 people who don't know Jesus yet. There's lots of other churches doing amazing things, but we want to do our part. So part of our vision is we want to see 500 people, girls and boys, women and men, baptized because their lives have been transformed by Jesus and they're getting started on this journey. We don't know if it's going to take six months or two years, but that's part of the vision, experiencing God's love. 500 people. And here's the thing. It may be your friend. It may be your family member. It may be your neighbor. It may be your coworker. It may be your classmate. And God's going to maybe, just maybe use your voice to help bring his story to life in someone else's story. 50 baptized two weeks ago on Easter, but May 23rd, we've got another baptism. Sign-ups are already going. If you have not been baptized since making a decision to follow Christ, don't miss the celebration of May 23rd. Amen? If you were here two weeks ago, do not miss that. If there's somebody you need to say, there's an urgency, I want them to hear the gospel, then guess what? You can share the gospel with them. In the next few weeks, start praying as never before for God to turn hearts of people towards him. 
when it comes to growing in community, our vision is we want to see in, in the near future 2,000 people deeply connected in groups with each other, growing spiritually, serving together, being a part of what God is doing, and 2,000 people who are being armed and, and they're deepening in their faith. They're, they're ready for this life because they're growing in community with others. 2,000, that's pretty amazing, right? Yes. Here's the deal, though. We have a lot of people right now who are coming saying, I want community. What, what, what we're needing right now is people say, I'll help lead. Maybe right now is the time for some of us to say, it's time to get back in the game. It's time to sign up and facilitate one of those groups. We'll, we'll do everything we can to help you in that. Lastly, when it comes to serving with compassion, we, we have a vision for 2,000 people connected on serve teams, using their gifts and their talents, being on mission with God. On, on Easter, just on that one day, 350 of you served on that one day. That's pretty great. But our, our vision is to see 2,000 of you connected to serve teams where you've got relationship and you've got purpose. And you're seeing, we're seeing God do what only God can do. The scripture that's been on my heart as it relates to our vision now for a few years is Romans chapter 15, verse 13. I've turned it into a prayer. I'm gonna pray over us in just a moment. But here's what that passage says. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That, that as we experience God's hope filling us and joy and peace as we trust in him, that our lives, our church would overflow to this city by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as I was praying for some of you today, not by name, but just praying for individuals who may be listening to me and things like this have been said or questions like this have been asked. Some have said, I don't even know if I need the church anymore. I don't know if I need the church. What if you turn that question to this, but does the church need me? Maybe there's some other people who, yeah, you're like, I don't need them. Well, maybe that's the wrong question. Maybe that question's too rooted in you and not rooted in them. And they're like, I, I could really use your encouragement. I could really use your wisdom. I could really use your maturity. I could really use your prayers. But, but because we're only asking, I don't know if I need this, we're missing, do they need this? What if when you're saying, I don't know if I'm really getting anything out of this anymore. Well, what if the question you asked was, well, what could I give to this? What if it's not about what you get out of it, but it's what you give to others? Maybe that's where transformation starts to take place and happen in your life. Instead of, for some of us, when it comes to this topic, say, well, I think, what if we just ask this simple question? What does Jesus say? And Jesus says, I will build my church. I'll build my church and my church on, on mission in this world, accomplishing my purposes. He's like, it's a powerful force of, of love and grace and truth and righteousness standing up for, for, for God's glory in this world, standing up for hurting people and against divisiveness, standing up. Jesus is saying, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. There's nothing in this world that can stop God's work. There's no one in this world that can stop God's plan. There, there's nothing that comes against you. There's no weapon that will prosper that God wouldn't say, I've conquered that and through me you're more than conquerors. Would you follow me? Would you trust? Would you deny yourself? Would you take up your cross? Will you follow me? Will you see me do in you and through us y'all? Oh y'all, what only God can do and follow him for his glory. And say, I'm, I get it's going to take me getting out of my comfort zone. I get it's going to take me making some, some changes. I, I'm so desperate for transformation. I want transformation more than I want comfort and safety. I want the new future that God has more than the nostalgic vision I have of what was in February of 2020. And I'm following him. I'm denying myself. I'm taking up my cross. And I'm following Jesus all the way. Are you doing that too? We pray with me. Dear God, we need you. 
We need your grace. We need your power. We need your spirit to fill us. We are desperate for you, God, to do what only you can do. But we thank you that we're not in control. You are. We thank you this is not our church. It's your church. And you say if it's your church, not even the gates of hell, not, there's not any power, there's not any person who can stop your work. So we say, Jesus, do what only you can do. And may the God of hope, God of hope, fill us with power, fill us with joy, fill us with peace as we trust in you so that we overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Fill our lives, fill this place. God, turn our hearts to you today. We wanna know you, we wanna go after you. We don't want anything to get in our way. So those things that try to hold us back, those sins that easily ensnare, those chains and shackles that wanna hold us back, the fears and the anxieties that could prohibit us, we pray they are destroyed in your name, Jesus, nothing. Nothing can stop you from doing what only you can do. The gates of hell cannot overcome it. We follow you, we dedicate ourselves to you, and we pray, Jesus, have your way and be glorified. And it's in your name we pray, amen and amen.